one of the big points that I want to make is a lot of us here are talking about this as an emerging field, a new field. I don't at all see it that way. This is about connecting the dots of mental illness. This field dates back at least a century and a half. We have an abundance of evidence of metabolic abnormalities in the brains of people with mental disorders, and I am going to review just a tiny snapshot of some of that. But I want to start with a big picture question, what causes mental illness? Right now, our field is clear and unequivocal in its answer. No one knows. All we know are risk factors. And to date, nobody has been able to synthesize all of them and put them together in a coherent way. What are the risk factors? It's the biopsychosocial model. There are biological factors, psychological factors, and social factors that all come together to result in mental illness. Now, although most people think about mental disorders, some of them are biological disorders. Bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, those are biological. And then there are other ones that are social or psychological, like anxiety or depression. But in fact, those distinctions are not true. Biological, psychological, and social affect all mental disorders, including schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, including anxiety and depression. And I have been asking the question for years, could metabolism play a role? But that begs the question, what is metabolism? So although a lot of people have simplistic thoughts about metabolism, metabolism is burning calories. Metabolism is about metabolic syndrome. It's about obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. I take a much broader perspective. That is not metabolism. Those are parts of metabolism. But metabolism, a simplistic definition. Living organisms take food. They convert it into energy and building blocks used to maintain or grow cells. Metabolism also includes the appropriate management of waste products. In fact, metabolism is fundamental to the definition of all living organisms. So in a way, of course, mental disorders are related to metabolism. Everything is. And this graphic that you see is just one representation of the various metabolic pathways in the human body. The circle that you see is the Krebs citric acid cycle. I'm also going to be talking about mitochondria. So what are mitochondria? Although most people know the definition, the powerhouse of the cell, the reality is research over the last 20, 30 years suggests something far greater. Mitochondria are so much more than powerhouses, although powerhouse function is important. They are critical players in what I would call metabolism. There are hundreds or thousands of them in each cell. They are highly dynamic. They move around cells. They fuse with each other. They bud off from each other. They are involved in numerous cellular processes, including calcium regulation, the epigenetic control of our nuclear DNA, steroid hormone synthesis, and many other functions. So we're going to be talking about mitochondrial dysfunction because that's the buzzword these days, mitochondrial dysfunction. So what is mitochondrial dysfunction? I will argue that based on the numerous roles of mitochondria, this is actually difficult to define. It's difficult to measure. So the most common way to measure it is called oxidative stress or reactive oxygen species, terms most people have heard of. And so this dates back to 1956 when Dr. Denham Harmon proposed the free radical theory of aging. And what is aging? Aging is about metabolic disorders. Aging is about obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. And what causes those diseases? He proposed free radicals. In 1972, he amended this hypothesis, recognizing that mitochondria were critical to this process of free radical production. And in fact, the theory goes that mitochondria or dysfunctioning mitochondria produce free radicals. Those free radicals turn around and damage the mitochondria themselves. They can result in mitochondrial DNA mutations. That causes more dysfunction in the mitochondria, which causes more free radicals. And it's a vicious cycle that results in what we call illness or aging and death. But it turns out that this theory is not so accurate because free radicals actually serve a very critically important role in the human body. So here's just a timeline of some of the metabolic and mitochondrial hypotheses of bipolar disorder. There were many to pick and choose from. So in 1879, Sir Henry Maudsley quoted, diabetes is a disease that shows itself in families in which insanity prevails. Insanity is schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. 
From the 1930s to the 1950s, the most widely used treatment in the field of psychiatry for mood and psychotic disorders was something called insulin coma therapy. Now, I'm not advocating for the return of insulin coma therapy, but you're going to hear from additional researchers, insulin's making a comeback in the mental health field. This is nothing new. Let's be humble about what we're doing. Nothing new. They knew about insulin 100 years ago. In the 1950s, abnormalities in metabolic markers were first identified in patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, abnormalities in lactate, 70 years ago. In the 1990s, functional neuroimaging studies began, and we have a plethora of data showing metabolic abnormalities or metabolic differences in the brains of people with mental disorders. So those researchers are going to say, metabolic psychiatry, where have you been? We have been measuring metabolism in the brain for decades. Wake up. Welcome to the party. That led to the first hypothesis, the mitochondrial hypothesis of bipolar disorder proposed by Cato and Cato in 2000. That was quickly followed by researchers at our own McLean Hospital, I look at Virginia, who identified mitochondrial gene differences in patients with bipolar disorder and in normal controls. That same year, other researchers identified differences in lactate metabolism in the brains of patients with bipolar disorder compared to healthy controls. And since that time, there has been ex an explosion of research on the mitochondrial and metabolic hypothesis of bipolar disorder and also schizophrenia. I will walk you through just a couple of examples of that. But wait, bipolar disorder is genetic. It's genes, right? It runs in families. Well, in fact, there are genetic disorders called mitochondrial diseases in which people have genetic mutations in proteins that code for mitochondria themselves. 16 to 21% of those patients have bipolar disorder, which is an approximately 20-fold increase compared to the normal population. Three high-risk genes for bipolar disorder include ANT1, DISC1, and just this year, just a month or so ago, ACAP11. And what do these genes do? They actually all play a role in mitochondrial function and metabolism. There's a stem cell model. Researchers took fibroblasts from bipolar patients and healthy controls and reprogrammed them into neurons. What they found is that the neurons from the bipolar patients had mitochondrial dysfunction or abnormalities, and they were hyper-excitable. Among the bipolar patients who responded to lithium, the lithium in the Petri dish stopped that hyperexcitability in those cells. There's another study, mitochondrial changes in the phases of bipolar disorder. So, you know, where we measure mitochondria is important, and different cells have different levels of mitochondrial, fun they actually have different mitochondria, they have different levels of mitochondria and different levels of mitochondrial function. But a common metric is to look at mitochondrial DNA copy number and or function in white blood cells. And this research group looked at the three phases of bipolar disorder, manic, depressed, and euthymic. And they found that, on average, patients had decreased mitochondrial DNA copy number in the phases of illness, which then normalized in the euthymic phase, and that as patients got more and more ill, the DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA copy number declined. And in fact, there's phasic dysregulation of mitochondria in bipolar disorder. There are many lines of evidence to support this, including PET imaging of brain glucose metabolism, calcium regulation, levels of dopamine and glutamate activity. So what causes mitochondrial dysfunction? The real answer is numerous things. The good news is a lot of these things are things you've all heard about. They're all risk factors for mental disorders or the exacerbation of mental disorders. I'll briefly just mention two. So this, all of this research that I've mentioned has not been lost on the research community. The explosion of research of antioxidants and anti-inflammatory agents for metabolic and mental disorders is all based on the mitochondrial hypothesis of bipolar disorder. Make no mistake, this is nothing new. We are coming up with a new, not even a new treatment, because it's actually a 100-year-old treatment. <laughs> we're talking about a ketogenic diet, 100-year-old treatment. But we're talking about a new application that builds on a tremendous amount of science. So levels of inflammation are higher in patients with bipolar disorder, and I'll cut to the chase. 
Numerous anti-inflammatory agents and antioxidants have been studied, and at best, they have statistically significant differences, but they are not clinically meaningful differences. They do not change people's lives. Insulin resistance, we've all heard about insulin resistance. Insulin resistance causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And then we come to the ketogenic diet. So what is the ketogenic diet doing? I know some, many of you could give five-day conferences on this topic. What is the ketogenic diet doing? It's doing lots of things. It's changing neurotransmitters, ion channel regulation, levels of inflammation, the gut microbiome, blah, blah, blah. But I, I am going to focus right here. It induces mitochondrial biogenesis. It induces mitophagy. So we are healing mitochondria and we are changing metabolism when people are on a ketogenic diet. So what are some of the challenges of advancing this work? And I am only going to map out the academic challenges. There are many political challenges, reimbursement challenges, and others involved in this. The academic challenges of advancing this work. The reality is mitochondrial dysfunction has been found in everything else. It's been found in obesity, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, cancer, aging. So in order to really explain the mitochondrial theory of bipolar disorder, we have to be able to explain the mitochondrial theory of everything. Mitochondrial function is difficult to measure, can be different in different cells, and it often changes due to these factors listed. There are heterogeneous symptoms in people with the exact same mitochondrial mutations. So you can have two people from the same family, exact same mitochondrial mutation. One can have bipolar disorder, the other may not. And people with the exact same symptoms, bipolar disorder, may have very different mitochondrial or metabolic abnormalities or findings. The biggest challenge to this work, make no mistake, is that many of our current treatments cause mitochondrial dysfunction. They cause metabolic abnormalities. And so on the, on, on the surface, for most clinicians and researchers, if you're saying metabolism or mitochondrial dysfunction causes mental illness, why the hell would our treatments work? You have to be wrong. And you better dare not say that our treatments might actually be causing harm because then you would be a dangerous quack. If we get past that, then we have a multi-billion dollar pharmaceutical industry who will not want a paradigm shift. But the reality is two leading researchers, two leading researchers who have committed their careers to the mitochondrial hypothesis of bipolar disorder. Here are two quotes from Cato, the original proposer. Even if we say that mitochondria and calcium signaling are involved in bipolar disorder, it's no different from saying that cells are involved in bipolar disorder because most cells have mitochondria and calcium signaling plays a role in everything. So what are we really saying? Another person who will go unnamed but is a leader in this field. We need a supercomputer that can analyze chaos theory to figure this out. And with that said, I will audaciously or stupidly <laughs> share with you that uh, I believe the dots do connect in very clear and plausible ways. And that once the dots are connected in these clear and plausible ways, we can actually make accurate predictions about a wide variety of things that we already know to be true in the mental health field. And I do believe that the metabolic and mitochondrial hypothesis of bipolar disorder, which I am calling the brain energy theory in my book, has the potential to transform our field. Thank you.